Divya Chakravarti. She completed her undergraduate studies from SRM University and she went on to pursue her masters in historic preservation and urbanism and study of the built environment from the University of California, Los Angeles. She went on to work for the Department of Planning and Preservation for the city of Pasadena, California. She also did a brief stint of work for Historic Scotland, Edinburgh, UK. She had also worked on conservation projects like Kalsa Mahal, Gokhale Hall in Chennai and Marimala Park Educational Trust in Mysore. She is currently working as a director of Samrakshan Heritage Consultancy. She is also a co-founder of the Artisan Reprisal of Traditional Materials. method and technology she goes on to conduct workshops to revive traditional and lost methods of construction welcome to the ugc lecture series for bachelors of architecture the subject we are discussing is environmental science and the topic we'll be delving into is environment ecosystems and biodiversity In this lecture we'll be looking into threats to biodiversity conservation of biodiversity so we have looked into biogeography the different zones within our country and this is just within india so you can imagine the number of zones that are there across the globe and the number of provinces that are there across the globe so if you look into trans himalayan region the himalayan ranges immediately north of the great himalayan range are called the trans himalayas this region with its sparse vegetation has the richest wild sheep and goat community in the world the snow leopard is also found here next you have the himalayas the himalayas consist of the youngest and the loftiest mountain chains in the world they have attained a unique personality owing to their high altitude steep gradient rich temperate flora The forests are very dense with extensive growth of grass and evergreen tall trees. Then you have the semi-arid areas. Adjoining the desert are the semi-arid regions, which is a transitional zone between the desert and the denser forests of the Western Ghats. The natural vegetation is thorn forest. This region is characterized by discontinuous vegetation cover with open areas of bare soil. and soil water deficit throughout the year then you have the western ghats the mountains along the west coast of the peninsular india are the western ghats which constitute one of the unique biological regions of the world these ma- these mountains rise to an average altitude between 900 to 1500 meters above sea level intercepting monsoon winds from the southwest and creating a rain shadow in the region to their east then you have the northwest desert regions this region consists of parts of rajasthan kutch delhi and parts of gujarat the climate here is characterized by very hot and dry summers and then cold winters rainfall is less than 70 cm and the plants here are mostly xerophytic so you have camels wild asses foxes and snakes are found in this hot and arid deserts then you have the deccan plateau beyond the ghats is the deccan plateau a semi arid region lying in the rain shadow of the western ghats the highlands of the plateau are covered with different types of forests which provide a large variety of forest products the next important zone is the gangetic plain In the north is the Gangetic Plain extending up to the Himalayan foothills. This is the largest unit of the Great Plain of India. The thickness in the alluvial sediments varies considerably with maximum being in the Gangetic Plains. The physiogeographic scenery varies greatly from arid semi-arid landscapes of Rajasthan plains to the humid and per-humid landscapes of the Delta and Assam valley in the east. Then you have northeast India which is one of the richest flora regions in the country it has several species of orchids bamboos ferns and other plants here are the wild relatives of cultivated plants such as banana mango other citrus and pepper can be found last group is the island group 
the two group of islands you have is the arabian sea islands and the bay of bengal islands which differ significantly in origin and physical characteristics with a maximum width of only 58 kilometers the island forests of lakshadweep in the arabian sea have some of the best preserved evergreen forests of the country and some of the islands are fringed with coral reefs and many of them are covered with thick forests and some of them are highly dissected these are some of the species in the trans himalayan zone the himalayan pet viper the black neck crane and the chiru the himalayan zone you have the ibex the red panda and the monal pheasant the indian desert zone you have the black buck the flamingo and the wild ass the semi arid zone the tiger western ghats you have the lion tailed macaw malabar civet and the hornbill deccan peninsula we have the swamp deer jordan's corsa and the mugger and the gangetic plains you have the one horn rhino otter and the terrapin biodiversity at local level or state level as we will refer to it we look into andhra pradesh as a case study or as a sample andhra pradesh has a rich biological diversity which consists of four national parks and 21 wildlife sanctuaries you have the kasu brahmananda reddy national park which was built in 1994 when the word built is used it is pretty much being recognized as a national park it's been in existence for years together before that and it's about 1.5 km square in area the next prominent one is the mahavir harina vanasthali national park this is about 15 square kilometers mrugavani national park around 3.7 square kilometers shri venkateshwara national park in 1989 about 353 square kilometers and the brahmananda national reddy national park is actually located in the jubli hills in hyderabad andhra pradesh it's named after the former chief minister it's described as the jungle amidst the concrete jungle and it's one of the most successful examples of how in spite of being part of a city landscape it is still well preserved and protected if usually the concept of a forest or a wildlife sanctuary or a national park is outskirts surrounded by hills and forests and trees but here it's bang in the center of the city the park has around 600 species of plant life 140 species of birds and 30 different varieties of butterflies and reptiles animals making their home in the park include the pangolin the small indian civet peacock the jungle cat and porcupines biodiversity at a global level cellular life has existed on earth for probably more than 3500 million years but for more than half of this time is cons- consisted only of prokaryotes that is unicellular organisms such as bacteria and blue green algae multicellular that is the metazoans first appeared in the fossil record about 600 million years ago during the earlier part of the cambrian period a wide diversity of multicellular forms appeared with relative suddenness the early metazoans inhabited the sea the land was colonized during the silurian period and the devonian period years about 340 to 440 million years ago parallelly what happened with the land animals is the terrestrial vascular plants also appeared but the major problem occurred amongst the angiosperms that is the flowering plants which diversified enormously during the cenozoic era which from today is around 65 million years ago the present geological era is perhaps the richest in biodiversity currently we have about 2.1 million species have been identified while many more species are believed to be in existence according to unep in 94 the estimate the total number of species that might have exist on earth ranged between 9 to 52 million invertebrate animals and plants which make up most of the species about 70% of all known species are invertebrates that is animals without backbone such as insects sponges worms etc while 15% are plants 
Following the Earth Summit in 92, it became evident that there is a growing need to know and scientifically name the huge number of species which are still unknown on this earth. The purpose of botanical gardens. Four ethnobotanical gardens with about 400 species were established in four regional centers in the state at Rajamandri, Tirupati, Mulugu near Hyderabad and Achutapuram in Khaman district to create awareness on medicinal plants amongst officials as well as the staff of the department and the general public as well. Sample plots of different medicinal plants are raised in these gardens. The ethnobotanical garden at Rajamandri has arboretum too with various tree species collected and planted basing on Bentham and Hooker's classification. The production of seed and seedlings of different species for utilization as planting material is also achieved in these gardens on a limited scale. There is an enormous scope for increasing this activity, not only within the state but also across the country. Looking at India as a mega diversity nation, the country has a rich heritage of biodiversity encompassing a wide spectrum of habitats from tropical rainforests to alpine vegetation from temperate forests to coastal wetlands. Almost all the biogeographical regions of the world are represented in India. With a mere 2.4% of the total land area of the world, the known biodiversity of India contributes to about 9% of the known global biodiversity. India is one of the 12 mega diverse nations of the world. India is in 10th position in the world and 4th in Asia in terms of diversity in the plant kingdom. And in terms of number of mammalian species, the country ranks 10th in the world and in endemic species of higher vertebrates, it ranks 11th. In terms of number of species contributed to agriculture and animal husbandry, it ranks 7th. India has two major realms, the Palearctic realm and the Indo-Malayan realm. And you have three biomes, namely the tropical humid forests, the tropical dry deciduous forests and the warm desert or the semi-deserts. Now if you look at the different realms across, we will be discussing only the Paleo-Arctic and the Indo-Malayan because India is involved as a borderline across both these realms. If you look at the Paleo-Arctic realm, it is one of the eight ecozones dividing the earth's surface. Physically, the Palearctic is the largest ecozone. It includes the terrestrial ecoregions of Europe, Asia, north of the Himalayan foothills, which comes India, northern Africa, and the northern and central parts of the Arabian Peninsula. Palearctic realm, this is one of the largest regions which includes different continents. There occurs a great variety in the number of species of flora in the Palearctic realm. The number of fauna is also quite variable. One bird family, the Anxenters, is endemic to the Palearctic region. The Holarctic has four other endemic bird family, the Divers, Grouse, Auks and the Waxwings. There are no endemic mammal orders in this region, but several families are endemic. Moving on to the Indo-Malayan realm, this extends from Afghanistan through the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia to lowland southern China through Indonesia as far as Java, Bali and Borneo. This realm also includes the Philippines, the lowland of Taiwan and Japan's Ryukyu Islands. Most of the Indo-Malaya was originally covered by forests, mostly tropical and subtropical moist broadleaf forests with tropical and subtropical predominant in this area which is part of India as well as Southeast Asia. If you look at the distribution over here of flora and fauna, you have plant species right from the desert plant to mangrove plants are present. Two orders of mammals that is are you have endemic to this area. Then you have many other animals like the leopard, tigers, water buffaloes, the Asian elephant, the Indian rhino, the Java rhino, 
all of these are typical to this area. Indomalaya has three endemic bird families and that's also very important. Anything with respect to endemic species has to be registered with that realm because that actually states the importance of that realm. If that realm discontinues to exist for some particular reason, those species are considered endangered or extinct. India can be divided into 10 biogeographic zones like we have discussed and 26 provinces which represent pretty much the major ecosystems of the world. India figures with two hotspots, the Western Ghats and the Eastern Himalayas. Endemism, that is species which are restricted only to a particular area is referred to as endemic. India shows a good number of endemic species, about 60% of amphibians and 50% of lizards are endemic to India. Western Ghats are the maximum site of endemism. It has about 26 recognized endemic centers. If you look at the protected area, a protected area is defined by the World Conservation Union as an area of land or sea that is dedicated to the protection and maintenance of biological diversity and of natural and associated cultural resources managed through either legal or other effective means. Biosphere reserves, which protects larger areas of natural habitat that is bigger than a national park or an animal sanctuary and often includes one or more national parks or preserves along with buffer zones. The buffer zones could be even part cities or urban areas that are open to certain economic uses. The world network of biosphere reserves is the collection of all 482 biosphere reserves in about 102 countries. This number is from mid-2005. India has 5 World Heritage Sites, 12 Biosphere Reserves and 6 Ramsar Wetlands among these protected areas. If you look at the World Heritage Sites, we have the Kaziranga National Park in Assam, the Kioladio Ghana National Park in Rajasthan, Manas Wildlife Sanctuary in Assam again, Nanda Devi National Park in Uttar Pradesh and the Sundarban National Park in West Bengal. Now moving on to conservation of biodiversity. Why do we need to conserve biodiversity? Biodiversity affects us all. It has a direct consumptive value in food, agriculture, medicine and other industries. It has aesthetic and recreational value. It maintains ecological balance and continues the evolutionary processes. It provides indirect ecosystem services like chemical cycling, soil management, climate regulation, water system management, waste treatment and pest control, conservation of biodiversity, biodiversity inventories, conserving biodiversity in protected habitats, you have two types, you have in situ conservation and ex situ conservation. Certain examples are seed banks, gene banks, pollen bank and DNA bank. Restoration of biodiversity, imparting environmental education, enacting, strengthening and enforcing environmental legislation, population control, reviewing the agricultural practice, Controlling urbanization, conservation through biotechnology. Now, if you look at the different organisms, you have fungi, protists, prokaryotes, plants, and animals. So, all of these animals is, are, play a very important role as a part of the ecosystem and therefore in biodiversity. So, right from yeast, bacteria, protozoans, fungi, plants, reptiles, mammals, birds. The enormous value of biodiversity is due to their genetic, commercial, medicinal, aesthetic, ecological and optional importance emphasizes the need to conserve biodiversity. If you look at any act or process of conserving, the protection or preservation management or restoration of wildlife and of natural resources such as forests, soil and water. 
So, all of this is encompassed in the conservation of biodiversity. It is basically defined as the management of human use of the biosphere so that it may yield the greatest sustainable benefit to present generation while at the same time maintaining its potential to meet the needs and aspirations of future generations. So, obviously conservation is not going to stop us from using or utilizing from biodiversity, but it is going to tell us how we can give back to it, how we can take it at a reduced rate and how we can supplement our needs from other sources. You have two approaches of biodiversity in situ conservation or within the habitat. This is achieved by protection of wild flora and fauna in nature itself. So, the example of this is biosphere reserves, national parks, sanctuaries, reserve forests, etc. Ex situ conservation or outside habitats. This is done by the establishment of certain programs or procedures outside of that of the habitat. It could be gene banks, seed banks, zoos, botanical gardens, culture collection centers, etc. So, even though the influence of man is felt in both in situ and ex situ, it is completely built from scratch in another location completely different from the habitat. It does not have to even be close to that habitat is ex situ. But in situ, even though man is interfering in the environment to create a sustainable environment, it is within the habitat without distorting or disrupting the life cycle of those particular species. Here it involves the protection within the natural areas. So, the biodiversity is protected in the environment itself. What happens in ex situ is we are doing it in an artificial setting away from the habitat. So, if you look at in situ, you have sacred groves and lakes, you have biosphere reserves. Biosphere reserves could be terrestrial or marine. The next way you can have an in situ conservation method is by propagating national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. Now, if you move on to ex situ, again you have the sacred plant home garden that is within it can be taken from seed banks and other sources. It can be taken to different parts of the country away from it being the source of the organism or that particular species. This is done through seed banks, gene banks and cryopreservation. Another way of ex situ is botanical gardens, zoos and aquariums. Moving on to discussing how ex situ conservation can be done and how it is done here. It is mainly done for conservation of crop varieties, the wild varieties of crops and all the local varieties were the main objective of conserving the total genetic variability of the crop species for future crop improvement or afforestation programs. In India, we have the following important gene bank or seed bank facilities, the National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources. This is located in New Delhi, here agricultural and horticultural crops and their wild relatives are preserved by cryopreservation of seeds, pollen etc. by using liquid nitrogen at a temperature as low as minus 196 degree Celsius. Varieties of rice, pearl millet, brassica, turnip, radish, tomato, onion and others have been preserved successfully in liquid nitrogen for several years without losing the viability of the seed. Next you have the National Bureau of Animal Genetic Resources located at Karnal, Haryana. This preserves the semen of certain domesticated bovine animals, especially it could be prized oxes, stallions and other animals. National Facility for Plant Tissue Culture Repository. This is for development of a facility of conservation of varieties of crop or plants by tissue culture. This facility has been created within the animal resource genetic resources. This is a typical seed bank. Seed banks help farmers and also research scientists to come up with genetically modified species. 
endanger animal species are using are preserved also using similar techniques the genetic information needed in the future to reproduce endangered animal species can be preserved in gene banks such that future they can be produced in the form of eggs or embryos the zoological society of san diego has established a frozen zoo to store such samples for more than 355 species including mammals reptiles and birds moving on to in situ conservation we have around 88 national parks and 490 wildlife sanctuaries there is an expansion of the protected area network population surveys and assessment and database creation mapping of forest types protected areas and natural forests improved protection efforts and landscape approach to conservation there should be a regular population habitat viability and risk simulation check geographical information systems and remote sensing in planning and monitoring creation of new conservation reserves community reserves joint forest management voluntary field based organizations and ngos we moving on to specific cases in our country these are the olive ridley turtles at the orissa coast which are considered severely endangered species a lot of things are being done to protect these species and at the same time this is the their fate getting caught in plastic bags in the coast of the sea in fishing nets and dying by the dozen conservation of the biosphere biosphere is obviously a complex system it has many statistical package for social science it's an interlinking in the form of a web and we have to keep the entire system stable so individual levels of the biosphere have also need to be kept stable as a conservation method we need to come up with development and strategies of protecting this diversity that exists in this particular biosphere why do we need to conserve biogeochemical cycles like nitrogen phosphorus sulfur carbon etc the gene pool of characteristics of environmental and human interest food webs and chains providing natural pest and disease control and many other such reasons if you look at the biodiversity of india we have about 10.9% of world flora so that's about 45364 plant saplings or species and subspecies fauna we have about 7.7% of the world species that's about 94317 animal species if you look at biodiversity in agriculture the number of wild relatives in millets we have is 51 fruits 104 spices and condiments 27 vegetable and pulses 55 and medicinal plants as a whopping 3000 so the main sources we have are gulf of manar great nicobar kanchanjunga the nilgiri the nanda devi all of these are main sources of biodiversity these are certain national parks and sanctuaries geographical information throughout the country every part of the country even the arid zone of rajasthan is very important for its thorny vegetation we have the tundra we have the alpine the subalpine deciduous all of that is very important so all of this geographical information systems gis remote sensing all of this has been has to be used in a positive factor and to record what kind of plant species is there across the country what kind of endemic species of animals is there across the country this is like the vegetation map of india but besides the vegetation of map each vegetational area suggests that one particular kind of species is prevalent there and also this gives us an idea of what kind of uses each of these areas will have towards mankind as well as what kind of relationship he can have with that particular region at the same time not overusing it and at the same time utilizing its resources to the fullest at the end of this lecture we have studied the threats to biodiversity 
and conservation of biodiversity. At the end of this lecture, we should be able to answer the following questions. Discuss the two important eco zones or realms in India. What is conservation of biodiversity? Discuss the differences between in situ and ex situ type of conservation. Why is it important to conserve biodiversity? That brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.